Hi, I'm Richard from Electric Classic Cars and welcome to another workshop walk around, this time outside. I'm going to be giving you a little bit of a tour of my latest creation, which is this 1996 Land Rover Defender, electric of course. And I think we'll start with the aesthetic side of things because uh, one thing I'm quite keen on with our builds is to kind of like keep them as simple um, uh, and as retro looking as possible and obviously this being a 90s vehicle I wanted to kind of make it look like the old Land Rovers that I knew uh, in, in my childhood which were more like series Land Rovers so firstly the colour everybody's going to ask about the colour it's Keswick Green and as I say what I wanted to do with this Defender was kind of make it look a little bit backdated as we say so what I've done um, some subtle little changes to, to make that happen. Um, keep the grille simple on the front. Uh, the light cluster here, for instance, I've got rid of that big plastic uh, big plastic surround that goes around the light. Um, and I've just stripped it back to this simple one here. Um, the bumper on the front, that's not a standard bumper. Normally they're very square and straight to come out there. This is actually uh, an aluminium one but it's uh, angled up here, so it improves the sort of entry angle, if you like, into you know, severe boulders and, and, and inclines. Um, the bonnet itself, it's a Puma bonnet, so it's got that Puma bulge, and that's nothing to do with the fact that we squeeze batteries in there. We don't even need this bonnet bulge to be able to fit the batteries in there. It's just purely, as I say, from a design and aesthetics point of view, I just like the look of it. So it gives it a little bit of an aggressive look so overall it's kind of trying to keep it just nice and simple um, one thing I've changed as well is on the mirrors so these mirrors are actually series mirrors they usually quite often sit here on series 2a's and uh, what we've done is we've taken that and just put them there made this and uh, in the machine shop we've kind of like turned a, a thread here and a thread there kind of mount them on the top of the hinge that idea has come from my Beetle days, because uh, old Beetles used to have the uh, mirrors on top of the hinges. So I've just taken that concept and put it there, because the original Land Rover Defender mirrors are a very utilitarian, uh, big like van looking mirror really. And while I'm talking about the hinges, um, these hinges are obviously not the standard Land Rover uh, Defender hinges, which are very um, square and basic. These are um, the old style hinges of a, a series Land Rover, along with the door. So the door itself has uh, got that inset handle, which I really like on the old old Defenders, uh, on the old Land Rovers. So I put that on this Defender as well. Um, I've kept it simple down the side. You'll probably notice the old fuel filler here has gone. So we've blanked that out, and I've actually hidden the charge point behind the old air intake. And obviously we've got type 2 charger there so we've got 21 kilowatt hour uh, three-phase charging there and also CCS charging as well so it's got rapid DC charging in it so that's the aesthetic side of things on the, on the front and the side obviously new cappings and things like that um, let's go around the back now around the back you can see I've kind of kept it retro looking again uh, lots of galvanized capping here um, and the, the hinge uh, brackets and stuff here, stainless steel, bits and pieces everywhere. Um, but to the keen eyed sort of Defender and Land Rover person, they're probably noticing something missing around about here. So Land Rover, in their infinite wisdom, seemed to, I don't know if it was an afterthought or what, but the, the fog light and, and reversing light um, that used to be on these used to either be a big round sort of light, you know, light stuck on here, or on these earlier Defenders, kind of a square one put there. And it just looked like somebody had forgotten about it and later just like, oh, you know what, just screw one of these on here. So I've got rid of that. It just likes, again, like makes it a bit more simple uh, around the back. And I've actually embedded um, the fog and the reverse light, I forget which one is which, into the rear here. So these are LED fog and reverse lights. Uh, and it just cleans up the whole look of the, of the rear here. And now our little trademark, um, Land Rover badge there with one little subtle difference, electric power. But again, it's just kind of keeping everything nice and simple uh, around the back, nothing, uh, you know, too cluttered. Uh, so let's just take you around the front and uh, take you to the interior. Right, show you what we've done inside here. So the first thing 
people notice is how much space there is compared to a normal Defender. And uh, I remember from Defenders when I was a kid, they're pretty, you know, confined spaces really. You know, you've got a clutch pedal here, you've got a handbrake lever sticking into your leg here, you've got a big transmission tunnel gear stick here and a high-low lock diff thing here. It's all very hemmed in. And the first thing you notice when you get in this is it's not. You've got loads of space. Um, one thing we did um, was a transmission tunnel delete. Now, when we've put the electric motor in, which is actually mid-mounted underneath here, we've got rid of the transmission and the diff, uh, the um, transfer box. So that means that we can actually get rid of the big tunnel that comes over here, as well as the gear shifters, which means that a uh, centre seat like this becomes a, a much nicer place to be. And uh, usually, if you are unlucky enough to sit in the centre seat of a normal diesel Defender, you've got your legs either side here, and you kind of like you've got your driver kind of going in between your legs here to change gear, and it's kind of hitting the handbrake here, and his clutch is in the way. It's a horrible place to sit. I remember it as a kid. But now, loads of space. So that's one thing we've we've done to improve the space. Um, and well, uh, down here, you'll notice the wood slats. So. One idea I had, um, and this comes from my VW uh, pickup, uh, I've got these wood slats in the bed of that truck and it's really handy to slide goods in and out and it protects the floor. But I thought, well, you know, I do a lot of off-roading and it's really handy to have something which is easy to clean afterwards, get all the dirt and dust and, uh, and mud out, either with a broom or with a hose. And I thought, well, I've had mats before now, carpets are definite no-no but these wood slats just work a treat. So I'm really happy with the way these have turned out because you know we go off-roading most weekends and it's a breeze to clean the floor out. We've got rid of the clutch pedal because there's no gears uh, in this vehicle. It's just a direct drive solution, but also the handbrake lever, which kind of comes out here and quite often just jars into the inside of your leg here, that's gone. So what we've done there is we've used a, a, what's called an EPB system, an electronic parking brake. Um, so that's as simple as just pressing a button. Like, like in most modern vehicles now, you uh, don't necessarily have a mechanical handbrake, it's just controlled electrically. So we've put a modern electric parking brake system in it as well. Um, interior um, dashboard has been simplified as well. I mean, this is not a standard looking uh, uh, early Defender dashboard. So again, we've just shaved off anything that's not really required just to keep it nice and you know, utilitarian and, and simple looking. So all of this is custom made by us and we've kept some of the bits and pieces like the dash tops and stuff. Right, so on the dial clusters, obviously, we've had to get rid of all the original Land Rover dials because they're pretty much redundant and won't work with uh, electric conversion. So we put our own set of dials in. Uh, we've got speed here, uh, motor temperature here. Uh, this is state of charge, so this tells you how uh, full the battery is, so from 100% down to zero. And over here we have amps. Now, you probably notice the amps dial here, the, the needles um, kind of pointing to zero, but zero isn't down here. Now, what that um, represents is when you floor it, it goes all the way up here, and that's amps getting taken out of the battery. And then below the zero line here, that's amps going back in for things like regenerative braking or um, charging, for instance. So that's why the zero isn't right the way down uh, down here. But apart from that, the, the rest of the actual binnacle, uh, um, if you like, is pretty much standard Land Rover. Um, I went with this aftermarket uh, steering wheel because I felt that the wood matches the wood of the floor. And equally, I, I like a big sort of um, uh, retro looking uh, steering wheel like this. I don't like the small sporty looking ones. So I thought a classic looking steering wheel, wood, wood rim to match the floor was an ideal complement for the rest of the uh, styling in the car. Right, let's get in the back. So here in the back we've got some forward facing seats. The rear seats actually sit on top of the sealed rear battery box um, and obviously we've got the um, wood slats in here as well to protect the floor. And while we're talking about batteries I suppose it's about time to start talking about the electric conversion side of things. So. Let's start with that in the old engine bay, so if I uh, lift the uh, bonnet, we can have a look in there. Okay, let's have a look in here. So in here we've got 60% um, of the battery pack, so the total 
kilowatt hours of this uh, vehicle is 100 kilowatt hours. We've got 60 kilowatt hours in here and 40 kilowatt hours in the rear. So it's a nice balance for the car as well. Um, there's a radiator on the front. You're probably wondering why is there a radiator on an electric vehicle? Well, you've still got to cool certain things down like the motor. So this is a dual radiator. There's actually one radiator here and another radiator here. They're thermally separated there so they don't transfer heat between them. This radiator and header tank here. This thermally manages the inverter and the motor itself. And this little radiator over here and this header tank here, this thermally manages the battery pack. Now batteries kind of get warm when you're putting lots of amps into them very quickly or taking lots of amps out very quickly. And as I mentioned at the uh, start, this has CCS rapid charging. So this has DC charging, which means we're putting quite a lot of amps in quite quickly. So you definitely need thermal management on your battery pack when you're doing that. And equally, the motor itself, I haven't talked about that, I will do in a minute. Uh, that can take up to a thousand amps out of the battery pack as well. So that's a lot of amps you're actually drawing from the battery pack. So again, thermal management is essential on vehicles like this. Um, and the uh, radiator here is because this is a Tesla motor. So a Tesla uh, large drive unit, which usually sits in the rear of a Tesla Model S, that's an induction motor. Uh, it's quite an inf um, uh, efficient motor, but not as efficient as, say, a permanent magnet motor. And what, it, what if, uh, inefficiencies brings is heat. So an induction motor kind of generates heat. So that's why you need um, a radiator to manage that heat, and also also the actual controller in the motor can uh, uh, can get quite warm as well. So that's why we've got radiators in here. This is a uh, a blast vent. So if you know we have a catastrophic failure in here. Um, that's, a, that's a vent that can release the um, uh, gases um, and at the back here we've got some chargers, it's, it's a three phase charging system uh, so it's 21 kilo AC charging and uh, yeah let's have a look at the, uh, oh there's a power steering pump here so that's obviously when you lose the engine you lose some aspects of things like heaters, power steering pumps, vacuum for instance so uh, we replace those with electric versions so that's your electric power steering pump. Underneath here you won't be able to see it as a vacuum pump as well it generates a vacuum for things like the, um, the brake system and with heaters for instance we use um, you know heaters out of electric or hybrid vehicles which is uh, usually a PTC um, heater and um, just think of um, a hand dryer in a toilet so you've got an element you've got a fan switch it on instant heat which is something you not normally associate with classic cars right let's have a look at the uh, rest of it underneath uh, we've got the Tesla drive unit um, to those that know their stuff, you'll probably recognize that this Tesla drive unit um, is kind of facing the wrong way. Usually that faces kind of that way uh, on the rear of a Tesla Model S. So we've brought it forward, turned it through 90 degrees. Uh, we've put a different gear set inside as well, because um, otherwise the top speed of this would probably be about 50 miles an hour. So there's a different gear set in there. Um, there's a uh, limited slip diff in there, or actually technically it's an ATB, which is a, a torque biasing diff. Uh, and that helps with traction because obviously you've lost the uh, the diff lock uh, because we've got rid of the transmission and the um, uh, transfer box. Uh, so we've compensated that somewhat with an A to B in the middle. And then that just essentially runs the two original prop shafts. Um, so you've got your rear prop shaft there, front going that way. And on the transfer box, as I mentioned previously, um, you've got a handbrake which is like a big drum brake here and we've we've lost that because of this conversion and you know we've taken the um, opportunity then to actually put an electronic parking brake on as well which kind of gives it that modern um, uh, modern feel to the uh, parking holds the vehicle quite well but at, at the same time it gets rid of that awkward handbrake which kind of bumps into your leg um, in the axles themselves, we've upgraded the axles to be able to cope with the uh, huge amount of torque. This motor can put out up to about 675 newton meters of torque, which is a lot for a Land Rover uh, axle to cope with. So we've upgraded the axles, half shafts, CV joints. Um, they've also got um, LSDs in the uh, front and rear axles as well. So there's three LSDs in here. So whichever uh, tires have the grip, the power will be transferred to them uh, uh, via the LSDs. 
Um, so I think that's pretty much it underneath here. Um, it's uh, all sealed as well. For those that are wondering, can it go through a river? Yes, it can. Uh, all the electrics are completely sealed. So uh, unlike a, a petrol or diesel engine, which need oxygen to actually make them go, uh, this is more like a submarine. Um, a lot of, sort of submarines and submersibles are electric. Uh, just think of that. Obviously, as long as the uh, electrics are uh, suitably sealed, there's no reason why you can't drive this at the bottom of the lake with some scuba diving gear on. Right, I think it's time to go for a spin. So starting the vehicle is as simple as just turning the key. And you see the dials just do a little bit of a dance there. Uh, and then to start it proper, you, you crank it just like a, a normal engine. So that's now on, on. Uh, release the parking brake. So you can see the parking brake is on. So just release that. Uh, put it in forward. And then slowly but surely drift away. This actual Tesla motor, because um, you can get them in two flavors, this is the basic model, um, which has about the equivalent of 450 horsepower, which is enough in a Land Rover Defender, quite frankly, because that gives me around about 0 to 60 of 3.8 seconds, which is pretty crazy in a vehicle like this. So to give you an idea what that's like, I'm just going to floor it now. In, in the, so this is normal mode or road mode. There's also off-road mode, which I'll cover in a minute. And I'll floor it now and you'll see what, it, what I mean by it's enough power. So I'll count it down because I've got to be prepared for it myself. <laughs> right. Three, two, one. So on-road mode is uh, pretty aggressive, let's put it that way. That, that's uh, definitely got my adrenaline going, that little squirt of the troll. But it's no good when you're off-road, all that power. Um, it's just too much. So to show you what I mean, if I just uh, you know take it up here a little bit in on-road on mode, uh, for instance, uh, having a really um, aggressive throttle response um, uh, is you know no good when you've got hardly any grip in mud and gravel. Um, even though this vehicle has traction control and three LSDs, you know it'll struggle to cope with 450 horsepower when you floor it. So in on-road mode, um, you know. The other thing is the regen is it's okay when you're slowing down to a roundabout on tarmac but when you're coming down a steep hill and you want to manage that descent it's it's not really going to be man enough for the job to do that so i'll, I'll demonstrate that now so in on road mode i'll just go down this little bank here that we've got next to the unit and i'll take my foot off the pedal now so there's some regen but it's just not enough to stop it and if i'm not careful i have to put my foot in the brake otherwise i'll be through that wall so now I'll show you what the uh, difference is between on-road mode and off-road mode with the hill descent mode. In off-road mode, the, the throttle response is really soft. Um, it also limits the um, top speed. And as I'm going over a hill like this, I'm going to take my foot off now and it should catch it on. There you go. So it's caught it now in hill descent mode. So the regen is really, really severe. And that will just manage the uh, descent in a really, really smooth way on some inclines and declines that have been down that I could hardly even walk down. Um, so it's a really effective hill descent mode. So that's it, our latest creation. It's uh, my latest toy. Um, it's an absolute weapon on the road, uh, you know, with Nauta 60, which is, uh, you know, supercar territory, quite frankly. Uh, and off-road, it's such a capable off-roader. I mean, it's really relaxing as well when you're off-road. You've got not just the wind in your hair, but obviously it's so quiet. You can hear the wildlife, the birds. There's no pollution coming out the back. And the actual off-road mode itself is really capable. I would say it's as good, if not better, than a diesel um, when it's off-roading. And in extreme off-road uh, situations where you've got one wheel up in the air and stuff, uh, just a dab of the brake just to kind of like let the LSDs grip and stuff, and then you're away. So there's no it makes off-roading um, really simple, quite frankly. There's no lock diff, clutch control, high-low ratio gears. It's just manage the throttle and manage your speed, and, and that's it. You can go up some really crazy um, you know, off-roading in this in, in a really easy way. So I'm over the moon with this vehicle, and uh, you know, every single weekend I'm off-roading in it, and, uh, and why not? So thanks for watching our latest uh, workshop walk around and uh, I'll see you next time.